Good morning, everyone. We're gonna wait for just a second, and here comes Jane. How's it going, Jane? Welcome to Take a Break with Jake. I'm Jake. Um, I'm here today with my pal Jane, who's a beautiful silvery cheeked hornbill. She's going to be showing off for us today. She loves checking out the phone that Kelsey's holding and flying around here on stage. So we'll get her to do some, some fun stuff for us while we talk a little bit about why silvery cheeked hornbills are so cool. Jane, can I come over this way? There we go, girl. Very nice. So silvery cheek hornbills live over on the eastern part of the continent of Africa, from about Ethiopia all the way down to South Africa, and they live in montane forests. So up high in the mountains, in the hills, they're living in nice big trees. And this particular species of hornbill really likes old, gigantic trees. So about as big as the giant stump that she's on, or even bigger, Jane would like to find that out in the wild and use a hole or a cavity in that tree as a nest for her and her family. Um, typically, hornbills aren't like the best excavators, so they're not super great at digging their own hole out, um, but they can like kind of finish what a woodpecker or another kind of bird has started. So they're um, finishers, not starters. Exactly, and then they make it really <laughs> nice. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now there are about 35-ish species of hornbills throughout the world. I think that's correct. Fact check me, Kelsey. I would if I could. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there are about 35 or so species. I should have checked that before I started out today. Um, and they're all ranging in sizes from really tiny little birds that weigh about as much as your cell phone, all the way up to the silvery cheeked hornbill, and then quite a bit larger. And those of you who have been able to come to the zoo before, or seen our photos and stuff on Facebook or Instagram, You've probably seen our rhinoceros hornbills and those are some of the largest hornbills out there um, they weigh quite a bit more than jane maybe about three or four times as much as she does wow i didn't realize that yeah and she weighs um about two-ish pounds at this point. okay so um, she's kind of like a medium-sized hornbill and then of course there are brown hornbills that live over in africa as well and they get even larger so all the different hornbill species are really cool and they're characterized by having this big piece of their beak called a cask, so right on top. Um, and scientists don't really know exactly what that's used for, but they think it's probably to help amplify their call. So out in the forest, this can it can be really noisy with other animals around, um, lots of trees and leaves kind of getting in the way and dampening sound. So they want to be really loud so they can communicate to one another. And so having that cask, in theory, helps them be very, very noisy. If you look directly at it, like she's showing you now, hi. Can I bite that camera? Hey, bud. She will bite the camera Great. if you Love let that. her. Yeah. Um, so if you look directly at her beak right mm -hmm. here, you can see kind of those layers of the cask. And those are basically layers, pretty much the same material as our fingernails, that are always growing and getting longer and longer and wider and wider. I thought you were showing me your fingernails with your hand out oh, like no, that. No, no, I was just getting into <laughs> What are you doing? Time. Yeah. Um, and so her beak is always growing and she's always filing it down on the branches of trees. So a lot of times we get asked like, uh, is her beak broken or did something chip off there? And actually the answer is no, she's just filing it down and she's the one who should do that because she uses um, all of her body to help her fly in the air. And just like you wouldn't want, like if you were like an airline pilot, you wouldn't want someone else checking your plane and like making sure everything was good. And you're like, no, I'm gonna do that because I'm driving this plane, flying this plane, whatever. <laughs> whatever you do with I'm planes. I'm an airline pilot, don't quote me on that. Um, same thing with birds. So we wouldn't really cope this beak down or anything. She does that on her own and that makes sure that it's you know nice and proper for her and keeps her well balanced when she's flying around. Now here at the zoo, Jane flies for our amphitheater shows. Which is where we are now. Yeah, we're in the amphitheater. Hello. Unfortunately, we're not doing shows right now just due to the pandemic and a variety of reasons associated with that. Um, so we were really excited at the opportunity to show you all Jane um, out here and kind of show off a little of what she does in the show. So she comes out from that hole um, in the wall behind us where she came out earlier today. She hops along, she flies around a little bit, she catches some great, she's a pretty good catch, um, and then she hops off stage. She's got a pretty uh, set behavior at this point. She's kind of one of our regular, like kind of bomb-proof animals, like 
kids can be really excited and screaming at her and she's just like, I'm still here. Someone might drop an ice cream cone over there. She's like, I don't care about that. I'm just focused, I'm doing my job. I'm gonna get my grape. Yeah, I'm gonna get my grape. Part of that is because Jane has been an ambassador animal her entire life. She actually came to the zoo in 1999 um, as a pretty young chick. Her parents had kicked her out of the nest a couple times, so she wasn't really able to be fully parent reared. Um, and so the people who were taking care of her ended up having to hand rear her kind of the rest of the way. So she came really, really happy to be around people. And she loves scratches. She loves attention from a lot of us trainers here at the zoo. I will say she also like doesn't like attention from certain people. She's like a girl of, you know, limited friends. I'll say that. <laughs> right, Janie? Few is better friends, right? Yes, you know. few good friends are better than a bunch of men friends, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and she uses this beak to like stab at people or things she doesn't like. <laughs> Just a fun fact about Jamie. Um, but when she really likes you, she likes to give or let you give her scratches. She never scratches back, I'll say that. Like she's not really a great friend. It's kind of a one-sided. Uh, yeah, a one-sided friendship, yeah. yeah. But she's so cute and perfect, it's fine. We all love to give her scratches. Look at those it's, fluffy feathers. Oh, no. And then the video you posted earlier to me, Kelsey, yeah. you showed that one little clip of her like with her neck all the way back. She really loves like when you get in here good and you're like scratching that neck really well, she'll like turn it all around to make sure you're getting all the spots she likes. And what's kind of interesting is I've been feeding her little pieces of grape throughout our little segment so far today. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we'll give her whole grapes, but it's really scary when I give her a whole grape and then I go to scratch her and I forget and then I feel a giant lump in her throat. And that's not anything but the grape that's making its way slowly down. That's just a fun fact for you all today. How easily we forget. I know, like I literally will hand it to her and then scratch her and be like, oh my gosh, there's a lump. It's the lump that I handed her seconds ago. That's like more telling about mm -hmm. me than it is about Jane. Oh my gosh, girl. So um, she, like I was saying, she's really comfortable out here in the amphitheater. For the longest time, we kind of just like carried her out here. We would toss her a couple grapes and then walk her off stage. But a couple years ago, we had a little bit more time and a little bit more um, energy to invest into training some more dynamic behaviors with her. And that kind of input of stuff from us has really paid off. Jane is a, a really confident flyer out here on our stage. She hops around with ease. Um, and it's really fun to see her moving around in the way that she does best. And that's typically with hopping. So hornbills are decent flyers, but they're typically not gonna fly like long distances like migratory birds. They're gonna flip from tree to tree and then hop quite a bit too. Does that sun feel good? And you see Kelsey now, her mm -hmm. wings are kind of like out a little bit and she's gonna lay her head all the way down. Don't You're worry about ridiculous. those ants, they're not gonna bother her there. Um, but she's really enjoying being in that sun. Most birds will do a thing called sunning, which is like a really fancy term, right? Basically, that means they love to sit in the sun, fan their feathers all the way out, and soak up that vitamin D. Um, it also helps those UV rays from the sun help kind of clean off any harmful bacteria that she might have on her. They also promote really good feather growth. And I'm not sure how much you can tell um, through the phone today, but hornbills like Jane have a lot of iridescence. Mm -hmm. So she's really kind of a green and black bird with some white on her as well. Um, and then of course that beautiful silvery cheek, which is how she gets her name. Now it's hard to like determine which species of hornbill you're looking at all the time um, because a lot of hornbills look very much like Jane. There's only some slight size differences or there's also like a gray cheeked hornbill, which differs from the silvery cheeked hornbill. Isn't that helpful? That's not actually yeah. helpful. So lots of uh, really cool hornbills out there, but you can see Jane here at the zoo in encounters, and then eventually you'll be able to see her in shows again. We have the stunning rhinoceros hornbills that live on exhibit here at the zoo, which you can come see now, now that we're open. And then we also have some really tiny Vonderdecken's hornbills um, that we'll be featuring in encounters and shows and outreach programs later in the year and next year. Look at her just laying out. She's like enjoying the sun. You can kind of pick up on that iridescence from this angle. I don't know if it's you guys so can see pretty. it. It's so nice. It reminds me like kind of like a fish scales, yeah, I guess. I don't know yeah. why. But birds do it better. So oh, for that. sure. Sorry, fish people. <laughs> <laughs> Has to be said. Absolutely. Do we have any questions so far about Janie? Um, not about Janie, but Dawn said, what about social distancing? And I guess it's worth mentioning like 
that Jake and I are both taking a lot of precautions in our regular lives and we feel comfortable being five feet apart versus yeah. six, so. We get our temperature checked every day when we come into the zoo. We're both wearing masks um, and we're staying as far apart as we can at most points. Um, we're okay. Thank you so much for your concern. <laughs> we're, 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 we're doing right. fine here for now, yeah? And birds, do we know whether they can get COVID? Um, I don't think that there's any like true research out saying yes or no, but by and large, birds don't spread a lot of diseases back and forth between humans. There are mm -hmm. a couple, um, like pigeons can spread some really gross things to humans. Um, but as far as COVID goes, I don't think that yeah. Jamie or other birds are able to catch it from us or spread it back to us. But we're always wearing our masks here at the zoo and we're always um, washing our hands and everything multiple times a day. So we're making sure that we're as safe as can be. And Jane, I'm sorry, or I'm sorry, Judy, I'm sorry. It's a little hard to hear Jake when he's farther away, but we're doing our best. <laughs> um, <laughs> Caitlin says, why is her beak all rough? Um, so I mentioned that a little bit earlier, Caitlin, but the Cliff Notes version is that her beak is always growing and she's always filing it down to make sure it doesn't grow too long. But you can rewatch the video once Kelsey posts it and learn a little bit more about that. Yep. Um, let's see, Finley, age six, um, wants to know what noise do hornbills make? So she's making a little one right now, and you can kind of hear that every time she vocalizes, she makes a tiny little noise, um, but she can actually be really loud when she wants to be out. <laughs> Coming for that pony. <clears throat> Um, so she can be really loud when she wants to be, um, and that is the way that they communicate back and forth to each other. So it's a pretty loud honking noise, um, and the rhino hornbills actually do the same thing. They can mm -hmm. be really, really noisy. It's not pretty like a songbird. It's like pretty like a hornbill. That's yeah, sure. it's, it's distinct. It's very distinct. Kelsey, if you want to come over here with me, I'll have you okay. lead the way, and then I'm going to come over there and call Jane over there. We can show her flying a little bit more. This is another one of the perches that she likes to fly to in our show. Let me see if I can get over here. Jane, do you want to leave that great sun and come over here? What do you think? There's more sun over here. There's a lot of sun right here. It's like absolutely not. It's like reliving that video <laughs> all over again. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. okay. Like, excuse me, I'm busy filing my beak down. Remember, yep. I said that she does that. Come on, Jane, let's go. She's looking at her other trainer, Kelsey, making sure that Kelsey doesn't have any grapes to offer her. Hi, Kelsey. Not me. Oh, yeah, two Kelsey's here with us today. A little difficult. This is like the thing trainers, like, we should never do because, like, I don't want her to learn that I'm always going to show her things when I want her to do things, but I'm going to do it because I want her to do it now. Jane, do you want to come to these grapes? There you go. Okay, she's gonna think about it. What's the easiest way to get here? What do you think? Just put these here. We'll let you figure that out. I got a couple of questions, Jake. Okay, I'm ready. Um, this is a really good one from Sophie. How many vertebrae does she have? Oh my gosh, Sophie, that's a great question. <laughs> we'll have to look that up and get back to you because I did not check how many vertebrae Jane has in her nest. Um, most birds have between 13 and 19. Okay, that's a vertebrae. good range. So between there is probably likely. I love that behavior that she does when she picks up the grape and then tosses it further back. What's that called, yeah. Jake? Um, just tossing, tossing it back? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's like a technical word or term for it. Um, Jane has a really tiny tongue in her mouth. I'm going to see if she'll let me... Can we just look in here? Do you see that little tiny tongue? A little bit, yeah. She thinks I'm gonna feed her. That's why she keeps like shaking her head. So that's her tongue right there. That oh my little gosh. flat flap. Thanks, Janie. That was great. I appreciate that. Um, so she can't use her tongue to like manipulate food around in her mouth. Um, so what hornbills have to do instead is they grab things in the tip of their beak and they'll often like squish it just a little bit to like test mm. what, what its firmness level is, like maybe what it tastes like, I don't know. And then they toss it back and swallow it whole. So like if I gave her a whole grape, she would totally take that. Um, hornbills like her also, she's like fairly omnivorous. She primarily eats a lot of fruit, um, but then she'll randomly eat bugs, um, other kinds of creatures. I've read that silver cheek hornbills will sometimes like maraud on other bird nests and then just eat the chicks, which is like why <laughs> birds are so cool. 
because they're not just pretty, they're not just smart, they're also vicious, and that's amazing. Um, so sure. they'll eat a lot of different things and they'll do that by catching it here in the tip and then tossing it back. And they'll also toss food back and forth to one another, which is really kind of cool. And silver cheek hornbills can be found in groups, upwards of like 200 individuals out in the wild. And they'll all fly together looking for different food sources and then they'll catch food and toss it to one another if they want to share. Jane, one time out here on stage, was like on my hand hanging out and then a bee um, flew by and Jane snatched that bee out of the air, crunched it to kill it and tossed it back and swallowed it whole. And I was just screaming like silently with her on my hand like, oh my gosh. She had no qualms about it. I had many qualms. Jane, that bee was such a good worker. I know. I and know. you ruined it. But it's, it's yummy. It was also a really good snack. So tasty. Another kind of interesting thing about them is, like, just like humans, they all have preferences with food choice. Um, so Jane doesn't like, I think that was just like a motor or something. <laughs> Jane doesn't like green grapes. Um, she only likes red or purple grapes. And really it's more red than purple. Like purple is like, mm. Mm. Green is absolutely not like I won't even touch it, even though it's a grape. Weird. Red is where it's at. Where? Oh. You know, good for you, Jamie. Good. Um, I wouldn't try to get too much closer, Chelsea, but if yeah. you can like point at her little feet, she's oh, like, oh, I'm not gonna mind. help you. Come back over here for us. Thank you. Let's see if we can, if you can zoom. see her feet at all. Yeah. See how scaly they are. Yeah. Um, so most bird feet are pretty scaly, and that helps them hold on to different perches. Um, Hornbills like Jane have pretty interesting toe arrangement. They have three toes in the back and or three toes in the front and one in the back. Okay. And that allows them to hop and have a lot more dexterity when they're hopping back and forth on the branches of trees rather than a lot of other birds that have two toes in the front and two toes in the back that can help them like clamp onto the trees when they're flying and landing. Um, the hornbills, because they're such good hoppers, um, this arrangement helps them a lot better. So like, don't touch my <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so Scott um, was asking, what do they eat in the wild? And that's just like different kinds of fruit that's lots, native there. Lots of different kinds of fruit. They eat a lot of fruit that's about like cherry sized or smaller. Mm -hmm. Cherry sized, like that. Um, and that is um, a weird thing too. They'll eat pitted fruits, like fruit that have stones inside them, like cherry. And when they're doing that, they're not fully digesting the pits they actually will regurgitate it back out. And so she'll eat like a bunch of things with stones or with pits in them and then fly a ways away. And then maybe, you know, four or five miles away, she'll regurgitate all those pits out. So they're really great seed dispersers because of that. And they're like helping grow new plants all over. Do you see those ants? Do you even care about them? There are ants all over her stump oh, here. She's hi. like, no, I care about the camera. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Patty says she is the picture of contentment when you scratch her. I know, it's the cutest, isn't it? Yeah, you're the cutest. Do you think she wants scratches here? Let me know. No thanks. We always make sure that we ask her if she wants scratches. Um, I think a lot of times when it comes to animal training, it's really easy to like get in this habit of saying like, oh, the animal likes this, because like maybe you or I like that. Mm -hmm. um, but as we all know, like reinforcement is not the same across all boards. So as some people might like, you know, a big fat steak as a celebratory meal, like I would much rather have a pile of donuts. Um, similarly, animals will sometimes like one thing but not another thing, and sometimes they don't want a certain thing at the same time you think they might. So anytime we're offering her stuff, it's not like, here Jane, take this, like you'll <laughs> love it. That's not gonna work with our training. And we give her a lot of choice and we give her a lot of options. So when I ask her if I want, if she wants scratches, I go like this, like scratch, scratch, scratch. And I say scratch, scratch, scratch. And then she said, okay. She like kind <laughs> yep. of tilted her head back. She's like, okay, I'm ready. Um, that's really important for all of our animals. We never want to like force them to do anything or uh, take on any task or challenge that they don't want to take on. Yeah, mm. you're pretty perfect, girl. <clears throat> Judy asks, did she notice when you started wearing your mask? You know, Judy, the first time I saw her after I started wearing my mask, I, she was like, who are you? So um, luckily she was in her outdoor enclosure and there weren't any other keepers around. So I just like quickly pulled down my mask. And I was like, Jane, it's me. And then she was like, oh, okay, it's fine. <laughs> um, and then since then she's been really fine. And I think most of our other keepers have had pretty similar experiences. They've had to be like, it's okay, it's me. And then she's fine. Um, a lot of the animals are quite resilient in that regard. So they you know, may be like kind of surprised yeah. or like, what's going on? And then they're like, oh, okay, we're, we're just fine. I'd have to imagine it's like when someone, like a keeper gets like a drastically new haircut, you know, yeah. same process. Absolutely. New shoes, 
Really, mm. like, more of the birds don't like when I get new shoes than the mask. It's <laughs> really strange. Petrie in particular. Really? He is so angry when I get new shoes. Yeah. Is that just because he loves the old ones? No. He just, like, I don't know, he thinks it's an attack on me or something. So then he gets, like, really defensive and, like, jumps down and tries to attack the shoes. <laughs> Bizarre. Did he react like that when we got new polos? No, he didn't care about the new colored shirt. I don't understand. Weird. Yeah. Birds are fun. They're kind of crazy. She's just like truly enjoying this nice little scratch. scratch She's literally scratch. bent back on herself. Yeah. And I didn't like force her into this. She, she leaned She's back. She's literally like doing it. Yeah. This is where you get the, you know, the two hand massage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll do a four hand massage with another keeper pre COVID. We would like get close together and just love on Janie. Cause you know, it's all about making sure that she's happy. Oh, for sure. What Jane wants, what Shane gets, right? Yeah. So I talked a little bit earlier about how hornbills like Jane are cavity nesters. So I want to talk a little bit more about how that works. So they'll find like a hole in a tree, maybe where a woodpecker or another species of bird has like kind of taken a lot of the tree out. And so there's like a decent sized hole. The hornbills will go in there and finish. And some species will definitely carve their own hole mm -hmm. better than others. Um, once they're in there, the female will start kind of like making a nest. It's nothing really fancy. It's pretty much just like a hole in a tree. And then what they do is the male and the female actually work together to layer mud and clay and twigs and poop outside to cover the hole up and just leave a tiny little slit. So then the mom will, you know, start actually nesting. She'll lay those eggs. And then the dad is outside the nest and he's bringing food, back and forth to her all day long. They can take as many as like, I think the one research paper I saw said like 28 trips in one day to go out, find food and bring it back. And he'll like swallow a bunch of it into his crop, which is the muscular pouch at the base of their neck. And then he'll regurgitate it back through the tiny hole to feed the mom who can feed the chicks once they hatch out. Their hatching happens about 40 days or so after they're laid. Um, and then it can take up to another two months before the chicks come out of the nest itself. So the mom is in there in that tiny little space that's dark and really stinky with noisy chicks for up to three months. It's absurd. And the dad's out there like flying back and like they're both doing a tremendous amount of work um, to keep these chicks alive. And being inside the cavity with very little like flow of air is probably really not fun. Um, and it's also a great way to keep predators at bay. So things like snakes and lizards that might try to eat their eggs or their chicks can't really get in. So that's a <clears> main <throat> reason why they're cavity dwellers. They're protecting themselves all the time. I've got a really good video actually um, on our rhinoceros hornbill page on our website if you guys want to check that out. I posted it a few years ago on Father's Day, recognizing how dedicated rhino hornbill dads are, um, but it's there on the blog if you guys want to look it up. Just search rhino, rhinoceros hornbill on our website and it'll it's come up. so cool. Oh my Jamie, gosh. You can see her little eyelashes here. Yeah. For humans, eyelashes are made of hair, um, just like, like all the rest of the stuff on our faces and our heads. For birds, that's still feathers. Those are just really tiny, specialized feathers. You just blew my mind. I know, that's a mind trick for sure. I hadn't, I don't know why I never thought about that, Jake. Yeah, it's insane. She has beautiful eyes. Yeah, she has stunning eyes. And you can see a little bit as she like, will put it over, will you do it? Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Do you see that other membrane? Yep. So that's that nictitating membrane and that's what they use to kind of help keep stuff clear from their eyes. Is that like what we think of as like the third eyelid? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, a lot of birds have that. A lot of reptiles do as well. Oh, Jane. She's just so peaceful. I know. I'm honestly relaxed watching her. Yeah. She's like the best part of most of our day. We just, you know, come. We're like, oh, Jane, do you need some attention? Okay. I guess I'll sit here for 10 minutes and just pet you. <laughs> She's one of few animals here at the zoo that really enjoys tactile um, interactions between herself and keepers. A lot of people will come to zoo and they're like, oh my gosh, can I like cuddle this or cuddle that? And it's like, yeah. I totally understand the desire to want to do that. But the reality is like all of us keepers here at the zoo, we really don't cuddle any of the animals unless they really enjoy it. Um, and for Jane, this is a really great bonding thing. This is a really great way to maintain a strong relationship with her. So that when I ask her to come out here and do a show with me, she feels really comfortable and she's really happy to be doing it. Um, because we never want to force our animals to do anything they don't want to do. 
Yeah. Judy says she seems really intelligent. How hard is it to teach her new things and communicate? Um, so for the longest time, Jane wasn't really learning new behaviors. We just like didn't really have the resources to do it. And then when I um, was really asking our curator and supervisor if we could like try to do some new things, and we were like, we had an extra staff member. It was like, okay, this is possible. Um, it took me a little bit of time to get her to learn how to fly to the hand. Um, she had never really done that before. Mm -hmm. But I figured out she learns really well on the ground. So I'd ask okay. her to come down to the ground and then just like bait her basically by holding a piece of grape on the other side of my hand. Yeah. And she would like come over and like accidentally step on my hand. Like hopping? Hopping like okay. my hand, yep. And then I, from there, was able to shape that into coming over when I would call her with my hand. And then she would just come over and get on the hand and then get her grape. And then we were able to like graduate up to being on a perch and asking her if she wanted to just like come over. Prior to that, we were just kind of like, Jane, can I pick you up? And she'd be like, okay. And we just like pick her up. Yeah. Um, this way she has a lot more choice and control in it. And that's what we're all about offering to our animals as much choice and control as possible. So um, in a nutshell, she's quite intelligent. She can pick up new stuff pretty quickly. But then there's also things that she just like, I try to teach her like a retrieval behavior where she would like go grab a piece of newspaper and bring it over to me. And it was like teacher error way more than it was learner error. <laughs> I just like, for the life of me, I can teach it with a parrot. I can teach it with a bird of prey. I couldn't teach it to Jane. I don't know. <laughs> she was just like, that behavior is beneath me. I don't need to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I don't need newspaper. Yeah, I don't need newspaper in my life. Thanks so It's much. really interesting how the different length of her feathers on her neck. Is there <clears throat> a reason for that, Jake? Yeah, so she's not using any of those feathers to fly. Obviously, like, they're helping in, like, the aerodynamics of it. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't need to be particularly long. These are all just pretty short squat feathers. They're really cute, they're really pretty. Yeah. And just like all birds, Jane sheds her feathers. They, they call that molting. So she'll lose random feathers throughout the year. This is a new tail feather actually coming in right oh, here. Wow. It's kind of cool to see. So that's what's called a pin feather. It's covered in what looks like a pin, um, like a plastic sheath, but that's actually the sheath of the feather, which is made of the same material the feather is. Um, and that is like a new feather that will come out and grow to the beautiful, glorious tail feather. Amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> Bridget wants to know, has Jane had babies? Um, if so, how long would the chicks stay with her? So they typically will stay with the mom for about a year or so, maybe a little bit less. Um, but Jane has never had offspring because she had to be hand raised for kind of the end of her adolescence and childhood. Um, she's not a really big fan of other birds. She likes to go point, point, point and stab them. <laughs> yeah. So she will not breed with a, another hornbill, right? <clears throat> Jake, I'm kind of like, from my angle, I can kind of see like orange inside her mouth. Is that like translucent of her beak or? Like in here? Yeah. That's her old food that's just caked on. Oh. So every once in a while we have to come in here and just like. Oh no, up back towards he? her Up like, here? tongue. Yeah. I, I think it's, seeing, yeah, I know. I think it's just like translucent area. Yeah. I'll show you on the video okay, later. Okay, great. Yeah. What we're seeing here, this like kind of caked on stuff. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, yeah. She eats a lot of banana. So that's what I thought you were talking about. And mm -hmm. the banana just gets like caked in here. Yeah. In the wild, this just like builds up until it falls out. Yeah. But I think it's really gross. So obviously Jane's not bothered by it. <laughs> I just get in here and me and a couple other keepers will take turns just like scraping out the nasty old banana and get that out of our <laughs> way. But that's like purely a cosmetic thing for us. She does not care. What? Right. Yeah. Um, Sophie asks, where are hornbills native to? So there are hornbills found all throughout Africa and Asia. And this particular species is found on the east part of the continent of Africa in really tall montane or mountainous forests um, from about all the way up in Ethiopia all the way down to South Africa. And they have like limited populations in certain areas along that range, um, but their numbers are doing fairly well out in the wild, although they are in a slight decline. And the main reason for the decline in the population of most hornbills worldwide is deforestation. And that's for a lot of different reasons. So obviously humans, we need room to like farm and to live and all of that. Um, but then there's also a lot of deforestation that happens for different minerals that are found in the earth that we use for things like aluminum foil, um, for plastics that we like to use. Um, so a really great way to help hornbills, especially ones like Jane, is to reduce your consumption of single-use plastics. 
not, doesn't mean just like, oh, recycle everything, it'll be fine. Um, not really the case. If you go to the grocery store, if you can take like a reusable bag to put your produce in instead of getting 18 different bags, like your radishes and your rutabaga will be fine touching each other. I promise I do it every week. Um, and then you don't have to use those plastic bags. And that's like a very simple thing that I think um, most of us could do to really help out. Um, I think with conservation, a lot of times we hear like, oh, it's just me doing it. Like, why does that matter? Right, Kelsey? Yep. Um, but here at the National Zoo, we're really committed to inspiring people to care about wildlife. And a really simple way that we can all care is by doing tiny little actions in our everyday lives. And that helps really well when everyone is doing one or two little things every day. Mm -hmm. Your choices definitely matter. And yeah. I know it's like hard right now with like the different things <laughs> yeah. for COVID, like we're all being asked to use these single use items, but yeah. just do what you can. Do what you can and that, that matters. Like your intent is awesome. Like just trying to be a better steward of our earth is great. Mm -hmm. Right, Jamie? Nobody's perfect. Jane's perfect. Jane is, Let me yeah. clarify that <laughs> statement. That's an official fact, not an opinion. Jane is perfect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Judy wants to know, do humans try and catch them for the pet trade? Um, I would say that, yeah, that I'm sure that happens, um, but hornbills are pretty well uh, bred in human care around the world, so I don't think there's a ton of wild capture happening for the pet trade. This is also like not a bird that you want in your home. Mm -hmm. Her poop is really liquid, and then it hardens really quickly, and then it's like cement-like. Um, so even though we hose her enclosure every single day, we often have to scrub it like almost every day and then also use different disinfectants to help clean it. So imagine having that like in your yeah. living room. The poop, the cement like poop is good when you're a cavity nester making exactly. a wall, so but it's not great for the every day. Yeah, not fun. Right, Jamie? So cute. <laughs> yeah, she's perfect. Any last questions? I don't see any. All right. Well, y'all, we really appreciate everyone's continued support of the zoo. We're so thrilled that we're able to have guests back in park yesterday. We were all smiling all day yesterday when all of our awesome guests came. Um, to learn more about our reopening policies and how you can reserve your tickets and all of that, you can go to naturalzoo.org. Forward slash. Forward slash reopening. Yep, right? reopen. Reopen. The link is also in the description of this video. That's perfect. And then you can also go to shop.nationalzoo.org. If you're not sure you want to come back just yet or if you want to support us in another way and you can find all of our awesome gift shop items online which is super cool um so check that out um, and we really appreciate everyone continuing to support us and um, coming back to visit the zoo so we hope to see you out here soon and maybe you'll get to catch jane our beautiful hornbill yep and we'll be live again tomorrow at 11 um with our southern tamandua yeah right okay yeah. the which... coolest mammal species besides cloud of leopard <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh we're just working our way through the ranks of jake's uh yeah. ranking of animals <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness all right well thanks guys for tuning in we'll see you guys later